Good morning, good morning, good morning. Praise the Lord, everybody. We welcome you to our Sunday morning worship experience, worship in the word. And certainly we thank God for you sharing your time with us on today. We do honor God who is sovereign and supreme. We honor his son, Jesus the Christ, who is Savior and Lord. And to the Holy Ghost, who is our sustainer, our leader, our teacher, our comforter, our guide. He who leads us in the way of all truth and righteousness. And to each of you in your respective places, we greet you with Jesus' joy and certainly in divine love. We thank God again for your presence on today. Well, we're going back to the book of Revelations, and uh, we're going to focus in on Revelations chapter 2, begin reading at verse 18. That's Revelations chapter 2, verse 18. If you're there, you will find these words recorded. And unto the angel of the church in Tartara, write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like the brass, or like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, or love, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins or the minds and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Tartara, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Praise the Lord. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works Unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my father. And I will give him the morning star, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches." Revelations chapter 2, verse 18 through 29. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you now for this preaching and teaching moment. We pray now that you give me power to preach and that I will teach with clarity. Anoint the ears, the minds, the hearts, the spirits of your children, that we might be receptive to what you are saying to us on today. In advance, we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And every heart said, Amen. Well, this morning, as we look at this church at Tyatara, we want to talk from these words, compassionate, but corrupt, compassionate, but corrupt, compassionate, showing sympathetic conscience of others, corrupt, evil and sinful ways. The church at Tyatara was compassionate, but they were also 
corrupt. Sound like some of the churches or perhaps many of the churches in the 21st century. Compassionate, but corrupt. So my Lord and Savior, as he revealed himself unto John, the revelator on the island of Patmos and had him to write to this church at Tyra, Tyra, Tyra. He wanted to remind this church about where they were. My brothers and sisters, it has been observed that there are valid comparisons between the biblical account of the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now we have talked about we have talked about um, uh, four of them. We started with the church uh, at Philadelphia, uh, which is the sixth letter, and then we backed up to church uh, church one, Ephesus. And then we talked about the church at Smyrna. And last time we talked about the church at um, the church at uh, Pergamos. So today we are talking about the church at Tyatara. So many of these churches had similar comparisons or similar ways. However, there are some unique features in this letter, which are a striking change from the letter to Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos. To Ephesus and Pergamos, the Lord said, repent. Now, you know, the church at Smyrna, he didn't accuse them of anything, so he didn't require them to repent. But he says to the church at Ephesus and the church at Pergamos, repent. Here to the church at Tyatira, he says that the opportunity to repent was given, but there was an unwillingness to repent. Tyatira, the corrupt, the coexisting church. Coexisting simply means that the church at Tyatira exists together at the same time. The church, the ones who were loving, they existed with those who were evil. They coexisted, they co-mingled together. So uh, the church at Tyatira, the the, this letter that was written to the angel of the church at Tyatira was, was the longest letter, but it was sent to the church in the smallest city. Tyatira was a military town as well as a commercial center. However, idolatry and immorality the two great enemies of the church was almost always present in Tyatara. Yes, my brothers and sisters, John had to deliver a message from the Lord of, of severe warnings to this congregation. So, the first thing I discovered and I want you to notice about this church is the careful thinking or the careful and concerned thinking by Christ. Well, you will find that in verse 18. Listen what it says. Let's see. And unto the angel of the church in Tyatara, Write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Here in this verse, and especially the latter part of this verse, 
the Lord assumes or uses a title which he did not use in the church at Ephesus, the church at Smyrna, or the church at Pergamos. He, in this particular letter to this church, he says something very profound and he says this because of his love and his care for the church. He's, he, he actually reminded them of his supremacy. So he says to them, I'll remind them, I am the son of God. Now, the reason why he said this in particularly because the church at Tatara had the tendency or the tendencies of worshiping the sun God, or the S-U-N God. So, so now Christ, the Lord, reminds them of his supremacy as being the son of the living God. Not only that, but he also reminds them of his severe judgment. I know what you're saying. Well, where is that, Pastor? Well, look at the next clause in verse 18. He says, who have his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. His eyes like a uh, flame of fire. You ever seen a flame of fire as it, as it flickers? So, so, so in other words, uh, the Lord is saying that I'm watching and I'm watching everything. I'm watching over what's going on in the church, in the churches, and especially this church at Tower Tower. I'm watching. He, 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 he watches and his severe his severe, his severe judgment is he is watching and the judgment is his intolerance of evil. He see what's going on in the church at Tyre They are coexisting. Uh-huh. Uh, 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 they, they, yeah, they are, uh, they are compassionate but they are also corrupt and they are coexisting uh, in the same place. So, so, so he reminds them of his severe judgment, his intolerance of evil, but also his irresistible divine judgment because it says that his feet uh -huh, are like fine brass. Now, brass is a symbol of judgment. Uh huh. So, so it tells of his endurance and his strength. Yes, these feet, the feet of Christ. Remember back in Genesis, it talks about uh, uh, that there will come one that will bruise the head of the serpent. So these feet will crush. The serpent will crush the enemy. So, 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 so Christ is saying to the church as he think carefully about what's going on. He, he reminds them of his supremacy and he also reminds them of his severe but divine judgment. So we notice the careful thinking by Christ. Secondly, I want us to notice the commendation for the true Christians in Tatara. The approval. Now you notice in the other churches, he starts off by reminding them who he is and then he he, 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 then he starts to commend them or approve of them what they are doing good. So he says in verse 19, 
He says, I know, here it is, I know by works and charity, love and service and faith and thy patience or endurance and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So we see here now that Christ commends them. He commends or gives uh, a letter of commendation for the true Christians in Tantara. Now regardless of how corrupt any church is, there are going to be someone who's going to be truthful that's going to stand for the truth. So what does, he, what does Christ do? Well, first of all, he commended them for their dedication. So he says, I know thy works and thy charity and service and faith and thy patience. Because, see, the church at Tower was like many churches of the 21st century. They were loving in their service. So he says, I know your charity, your love. Not only that, but they were laboring for their Savior. So he says, I know your service. I know you've been serving me. You've been serving me because you've been loyal. You've been serving me and you've been loyal to me. He also commends them because they were not just serving, but they were long suffering in their serving. In other words, I believe come hell or high water, there were some true Christians in Tyre that kept serving regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how down they may have been, regardless of how many problems may have been in their lives. They kept serving. So he commended them because they were, ser they were long suffering in their service. So he says, I know thy patience in verse 19. Wow. So he commended them for their dedication. When Christ looks at your life, will he commend you for your dedication, for your loving in the service, for your laboring for the Savior because you're loyal to the Savior, for your long suffering in the service, your patience, your endurance? Well, not only did he commend them for their dedication, but, but he also commended them for their dependability. So he says in the last clause of verse 19, and thy works and the last to be more than the first. He kept commending them or approving them of their works because that's what he saw. You know that Christ has an all-seeing eye. So he saw what was going on in the church at Tyre. So the emphasis was on works. Now let me help you right here. Works are good in their, in their proper place. Uh -huh. But they become deadly dangerous when they come between the soul or the spirit and Christ. Are you hearing me? You see, worship in the scripture comes before service. In other words, the Lord says, come unto me before he says, go into all the world and serve. So he commended them for their dedication. He commended them for their dependability. But it all was basically because of their works and not their worship. So 
after the accommodation to the true Christians at Tower Tower, now we notice the condemnation for the tolerant coexistence. Remember, I said the church at Tower Tower coexisted one with the other. The believers, the faithful, were coexisting with the evil ones and the unfaithful ones. So after the approval, after the commendation, comes the condemnation. After the approval come the accusation. So what does he say? Well, look at the next verse, verse 20. He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou suffereth or allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophet, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. Wow. What's going on at this church at Tau Tau? Why does Christ condemn this church after commending them for their love, their service, their faith, and their patience? Well, the excellences in the church at Tartara were literally overshadowed by a serious defect. The first person to entice the members of that church to, uh, into sin against God was a woman by the name of Jezebel. Now, of course, we know about Jezebel in the Old Testament who had a wicked and evil spirit. And so, in this context of the text, it is a symbolism of the, that's the spirit of Jezebel that was in the church at Tyre. And if we're not careful, my brothers and sisters, we allow the spirit of Jezebel to come into our local assembly, our local church, or even our own lives and cause havoc in our lives. You see, the church at Tower Tower was active in love, service, and faith, but its members were lying in spiritual adultery or adultery. Mm -hmm. In other words, the church at Tower Tower were more like a religious club than a true Christian assembly. If we look carefully, we could see that in the 21st century, in 2020, we can see and observe some assemblies, some churches, some baptized believers in Christ. They are more like a social or a religious club than a true Christian assembly. Saints, let me remind us that God wants his church to be trustworthy, loyal to him and his word. So we must be careful not to tolerate that which is intolerable 
to God. Did you get that? Let me say that again. God wants the church to be trustworthy, loyal to him and his word. So we must be careful not to be, not to tolerate what is intolerable to God. So the Lord condemns the tolerant coexistence in the church at Tyatara. He condemned that church because Christ was displeased. Look at verse 20 of the text. He said, notwithstanding, I have few things against thee because thou suffered or allowed that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Well, he was displeased because the church at Tyre, he was displeased because of their toleration, this, his, their toleration displeased him. The thing that they allowed to happen at this church or in this church. Not only that, but he was displeased because Jezebel's teachings displeased him. What did she talk? Well, it's in the verse. It says, first of all, Jezebel called herself a prophetess to teach, to teach and, su and seduce my servants. Jezebel taught the church to submit to infidelity. She taught them to do that. She also taught the church to eat things that were sacrificed to idols. So Christ was displeased with the church at Tyre because they allowed Jezebel, that bad spirit, to come in and to, and to influence the church by teaching them to submit to fornication or infidelity by teaching them to eat things that were sacrificed unto idols. So because Christ was displeased and in the midst of his condemnation, Christ said that he would destroy them because he was displeased with them he would destroy them. Sooner or later, Christ will be so displeased with our foolishness and our folly that he will destroy. Look at verse 21. Listen to what it says. And I gave her Jezebel, I gave her space to repent of her fornication or her unfaithfulness, and she repented not. Here it is. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except or unless they repent of their sins or their deeds. Mm. So what we see here, that Christ says he would destroy them. He would deal, first of all, with Jezebel's contempt. Mm -hmm. That's what he says in verse 21. I gave a space to repent of a fornication and she repented not. So 
he's going to deal with Jezebel contempt, her lack of respect or, or reverence. He's going to deal with Jezebel's uh, disobedience and disrespect. Wow. Not only will he deal with Jezebel's contempt, but he will also deal with Jezebel's corruption. It's in the next verse. Verse 22. I just read it, but let's look at it again. I will cast her. Look, behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Wow. Except they repent of their deeds. He's going to deal with Jezebel corruption, with the evil corruption that had occupied the church at Tyre. And so are occupying the church today. Not only will he deal with Jezebel's corruption, but he will also deal with Jezebel's children and her followers. It's in the next verse. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know. That's what the Lord says when he looked at the church at Tyre and saw the tolerance of the coexistence. He saw what some of the faithful was tolerating. And they were mingling with those who were unfaithful and evil. And they allowed uh, Jezebel, the bad spirit, to come in and uh, to teach in the church. So Christ condemns the tolerant coexistence at the church at Tyre. He was displeased, so he said that he would destroy them. But then, next comes the comforting to the truly consecrated, uh, the true dedicated ones to Christ. Now comes the admonition. So now he says, after he deals with Jezebel, that Jezebel spirit, after he deal with the evil, then he sends a comforting word to, to those who were still dedicated to Christ, to the truly consecrated ones. It's in verse 24 through 29. Listen what it says, and I read it fast because there's a lot of verses. But unto you I say unto the rest in Tower, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none of the burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod iron, and the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. So now, after the condemnation 
by Christ to the tolerant coexistence in Tyre, he sends them comforting words to the faithful, to the consecrated ones. Let's see what happens. Well, first of all, they were encouraged to keep living for their Savior. In verse 24, I want to encourage you to regardless of how severe things may be in your life, how devastating things may be in your life, keep living for the Savior. He says in verse 24, but unto you I say and unto the rest in Tyre, as many as have not this doctrine, the doctrine of Jezebel, and which have not known the debts of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Wow. I don't know when to shout. None other burden. In other words, he, he, he comforts them by telling them, uh, by encouraging, uh, encouraging, encouraging them to keep on living for the Savior. Keep on with your separated lives. Don't coexist with the evil of this world. Don't exist together and do the same things that this world is doing. Don't think it's all right to live like the world. Come out from among them. Separ live separated lives. Yes, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. He encourages them to keep living for the Savior, living steadfast lives. Hold on to your faith, regardless of how dark and dreary it may seem, how much confusion and calamities may come your way. He's saying to us as he comforts us, as he comforts the church at Tyre to keep living for the Savior. Living separate lives and steadfast lives. But secondly, they were also encouraged to keep on looking for the Savior. Wow. Keep living for the Savior and keep looking for the Savior because the Savior did declare that he was coming back again. And when he comes back again, he's coming after church without spot or wrinkle. So we keep looking for the Savior. It's in the text. Let me show you. To, let me show it to you. Look at verse 25. Here it is. But that which ye have already... Hold fast till I come. Those of you who have been faithful is faithful. Hold on till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of Apollos shall they be broken to shivers as I received of my father. Verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. That doesn't sound like much, does it? Well, the main thing that we need to remember here is to keep looking for the Savior to come. He says, hold fast till I come. That means that he's coming. Uh-huh. Regardless of how long it may take. I know we've been hearing it for years that we're living in the last day. We don't know when the last day is, but we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one to come. So, so regardless of how much evil that is surrounding us or, or even in our midst, we keep looking for the Savior 
to come. We keep looking for him to come because he promised us that he would come. And then on to, to add to that, the Lord promises the overcomer at Tyre, and he promised us the overcomer today, power on earth. Now, I know a lot of us think that we're not going to get much power till we get to heaven. But we're not going to need much power when we get to heaven because we'll be with our God. We'll be with our daddy. We'll be with our father. But he's going to give us or he promised to overcome power on earth. Let's go back to verse 25 again because I want to drive this home. I want you to get it. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come and he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end Listen, it says unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Power on earth. And he shall rule with them, or rule them with a rod iron, a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I receive of my father the Lord promised those of us who are overcomers power on earth not only that but he also promised the overcomer at Tyre and to us today he promised the overcomer power in heaven Verse 28, he says, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Wow. Now, the morning star is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And my brothers and sisters, when possessing him, when possessing Jesus Christ, when we have him, when we possess him, we possess all. We have all. So he says, he that overcometh, he will give us power on earth and power in heaven because he will give us himself the morning star. Isn't that good news? Yes, my brothers and my sisters, as we view these churches, and especially the first four churches, the first four messages to the churches at Asia Minor, we can see the dangers that still exist for the people of God. Like the church at Ephesus, we can be zealous and Orthodox, but at the same time, lose our devotion to Christ. Or like the church at Tyre, the one that we are discussing today, our love can be increasing, yet lacking in the kind of discernment needed to keep the church pure. Like the church at Pergamos and Tyre, we may be so tolerant of evil that we grieve the Lord. And by grieving the Lord, we invite his judgment. 
Mm. My brothers and my sisters, God, God's encouragement to these churches, except the church at Smyrna, is repent. Change your minds. You see, it is not only lost sinners who need to repent, but also disobedient Christians need to repent. And if we do not repent, and if we do not deal with sin <clears throat> in our lives and in our assemblies or our churches, the Lord may judge us and remove our candlestick, remove the light. Think about it. How tragic it is when a local church, a local assembly, or an individual Christian gradually abandons the faith and lose its witness for Christ. That is a tragic thing to happen. So my brothers and my sisters, the church is us, those who believe in Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior. So, if you have been compassionate but corrupt, because there are many people in Christendom who fits right into that category. Compassionate, loving, but they are corrupt do things that are good, but they are corrupt. So if you fall into that category today, I want to remind you that the Lord Jesus Christ says, I will condemn you because you have displeased me. And because you have displeased me, I will ultimately destroy you. But there is some comforting words. Yes, there is some comforting words in the midst of condemnation. If you've been living for Christ, keep living for the Savior. If you've been looking for Christ, keep looking for the Savior because he's coming back. He's coming back again. And if you don't know Christ and you haven't been looking for him or living for him, now is a good time to leave whoever you've been looking for and living for and locate the Christ, the Savior of the world. He is the answer for the world today. He's the answer to your questions, to your problem. But you need to know him. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you now for this preaching and teaching moment. We pray now, God, that you would allow this word today to sink deeply into our hearts and minds and spirits. We thank you for this word as you remind us that we can be compassionate but corrupt. So we pray now, God, that if there are anything in our hearts, minds, and spirits that's not like you, that has a sign, a symbol of corruption, that you would move it, 
in the name of Jesus that you blot it out and it will never ever condemn us again. Let this word sink deeply so we can be better, so we can be used by you in these days of prices and corruption. We pray now, God, for those who may not know you in the pardon of their sins, may not have ever received you as Lord and Savior of their lives. We pray that they will make a decision today. They will make a choice today to accept Jesus Christ, your son, as their Lord and Savior of their lives. And if you are listening or watching and you have never made that decision, you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we ask if you just pray this prayer with me. Lord God, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I need salvation. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and make me a new creature, a new creation. I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. I believe if you prayed that short prayer today, that you are saved according to the word of God. And if you believe that, I want to encourage you to connect with some local assembly, some local church where you can learn more about Christ and mature in your Christianity. And perhaps you are watching and listening and you have backslidden. You have disconnected yourself from the presence of the Lord and you need to come back to Christ. The Bible teaches us that whosoever will let them come. So it's your choice today to come back to the ark of safety, come back to a savior who loves you in spite of you. So if that's you today, we ask, we pray that you will make that decision because our father will welcome you with open arms. If you need help, in that regards, you can call our church or connect with any church of your choice, but you can call our church at 850-575-0818, Innovation Baptist Church, and someone will help you along the way with your decision. Or you can log on to our website, <clears throat> that's innovationbaptistchurch.org, and uh, someone will help you uh, from that regards or from that respect. So, my brothers and sisters, thank you for watching on today. We thank you for sharing your time with us. We do invite you back on Wednesday night for uh, Gospel Explosion, Pastoral Teachings, Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we thank you. Uh, God bless you. May God keep you. Stay safe. Stay strong. Be blessed.